Welcome to I Like Motorbikes, my name is Tom and today we're taking a look at this, the 2021 Honda CB1000R Black Edition. First off, the three standard colours you get are red, metallic black and silver that start at just over £11,500. This, the Black Edition however, starts at more than £13,000. So what's the difference? Well, there's no difference in the engine, there's no difference in the forks, the chassis, the brakes, etc. The only difference is really a cosmetic. And what are they? Well, you have these radiator shrouds that add to the aggressive look. It hides the radiator a little bit and you have a nice little CB logo imprinted in there as well. The cosmetics go a little bit further. You have the black subframe, for example, the fork stanchions, they're also coated in black to add to this black on black on black look. And as well, finally, we have the wheels. Now the wheels, the way they've been painted or powder coated, and then they've been machined back to expose some of the aluminium color underneath, it creates this real look of a spoked rim that is quite interesting and it adds to that modern retro vibe that Honda call the Neo Sports Cafe. Let's talk about the bike itself and the specs that you get with it. Well, first off, something that I noticed straight away was this teardrop style headlight. It looks great and also it's really functional because it has the DRL running all the way around the outside of it and coupled with the front indicators that stay lit all the time, even when you're not indicating, it means that you're gonna be a little bit safer because other motorists are gonna see you sooner. The specs of the bike, well the engine, that comes from the 2006 CBR1000 Fireblade and that's no bad thing. Yes, it might only produce 143 horsepower and just over 100 newton meters of torque, but what that actually means is, no, you're not gonna be running with the cream of the crop, your Tuono V4s or perhaps a Super Duke R1290, but 140 odd horsepower is something that sports bikes were having not that long ago. So really, it's still plenty. However, if you couple that to the 16 litre fuel tank, it does mean with a little bit of enthusiastic riding, you're probably gonna be visiting the petrol station a little bit more often. The bike weighs 212 kilos, which means it's not a lightweight, but actually it hides its weight really well. And like I say, with that 143 horsepower, it shoves you along like nobody's business. The seat height, that's 830 millimeters. So it's not low and it's not super tall. I had no problems and I only have a 30 inch inside leg. So for most riders, you're probably gonna be okay. However, I would say if you're significantly over six foot, six foot four, five, etc., I imagine you might find a little bit cramped in the hips with the seat to peg ratio. One major change on the engine for this year is that the RPM limit has been lifted up to 11,500 RPM to really let that motor sing. But crucially, what it hasn't done is lost any of the bottom end or mid range that makes this bike brilliant. Whilst the spec doesn't tell the full story, there's a load of kit that comes with this bike as well. For example, new for this year again is the TFT dash, but also with phone connectivity. It means that you can always tell what you're doing and when you're doing it. All the information is really crisp and clear and gives you exactly what you need when you need it. Another new detail for 2021 is the up and down quick shifter or blipper for other folks. So what that means if you're not experienced in any of this is that wide open throttle up shifts are absolutely possible, but also on the down shifts, you don't need to use the clutch, just dab down on the lever and the bike auto blips for you. Totally not necessary, but honestly, with how good this system is on this new Honda, it makes it really enjoyable to do it between bends flying up the gears, ba ba ba, and then coming into a corner really hot, grabbing a handful of brakes and just letting the bike do the work for you. Like I say, not necessary. You don't have to ride with it, but it's bloody good fun. The riding modes on this bike are all available to change whilst you're riding. So you don't need to stop and faff around with the levers. All you need to do is close the throttle and the riding mode will change. So what you can do is 
press the left hand switch gear to get it to change mode and it will flash at you while it's waiting to set. As soon as the throttle is closed, the mode will change and you can carry on in your new selected mode. The three modes that the bike has are standard, sport and rain. And all those modes do is change the traction control, the engine braking and the throttle response. So if none of those fit the bill, also have a fourth mode which is entirely user configurable, which is brilliant. So that's the way the bike looks. We talked about what the specs you get with the bike and all the numbers about it to play top trumps. But what does that translate to in terms of riding? Well, firstly, let's start with the chassis. The way it's laid out and the position that you're sat in means that you're a little bit sporty, but mostly it's really upright and really comfortable. Coupled with that, the chassis is really neutral. It's not too heavy on the front end, not too much on the rear, and you get a real good feedback from the bike. Coupled with that, the suspension, which is arguably good enough for the road, not incredible. The shower big piston forks really do help with that, but they were just a little bit too crashy in terms of rebound for me. I didn't get a chance to adjust the suspension, though it is adjustable, so it's probably quite easy to dial out, but just something I noticed with the bike that Honda gave me to use. The rear shock, however, it's perfectly adequate for solo riding on the road, but I imagine if you're north of 100 kilos or you're gonna be taking it on track days, touring, going with a pillion example, you might find the rear shock just lacking slightly, so potentially something to upgrade there. The brakes, as you can imagine, as a brand new bike comes equipped with ABS and with the front brakes being twin caliper, radial setup with a decent master cylinder, the front brakes are really strong. Rear brake, really easy to modulate, plenty of feel there and nothing to report. So thumbs up on that. On the move, I really enjoyed riding this bike. Like I said, it puts you in a lovely natural position. It's not too sporty, but sporty enough that when the road gets really twisty, you can have a lot of fun. Riding the bike through town is a doddle at 20, 30 miles an hour. The clutch is nice and light. Everything is in a decent position. The mirrors give you a great view behind you and it's dead easy. It's just that simple. But don't be fooled by the only 143 horsepower. This old girl can still party. If third gear clutched up wheelies and being a hooligan is your type of thing, this bike can still do it. It honestly is a brilliant bike for the road and will cover a load of people's uses. I can promise you that. Now sure, like I say, you're not going to be mixing it with your MT-10 SPs if they're really riding it hard, but let's face it, for the majority of people road riding, do you really need an extra 40 horsepower on top of an already 140 horsepower? If you're honest with yourself, probably not. What that means then is this bike is really easy to just jump on and go. I found I wanted to use it all of the time, even just to pop to the shops or run silly errands. But what that meant was I'd be 45 minutes down the road realizing I'd completely forgotten to go to the shop because I was having such a good time riding the bike. With the bike being a Euro 5 compliant bike, you do get this monstrous exhaust, which is a little bit of an eyesore. However, if you give it a listen, it sounds great from a standstill, starting up or riding it. The only time it's a little bit quiet is when you're going past people. However, is that really a bad thing if you're not going to be upsetting other people? I'll leave that one for you to argue. But realistically, you can make it be a little bit more noisy or look a little bit better. There's plenty of aftermarket options out there just to get rid of that big bulbous exhaust. So what's bad about this bike? Well, it's a little bit typical Honda in some senses in that it lacks a little bit of soul and character. Some people say character is just a code word for unreliability. Italian bike owners, I'm looking at you. But realistically, it doesn't have that little something. James May might say, for example, gives you that little fizz behind the penis. Not my words, but I think you know what I'm trying to say. It's just not, I don't wanna say exciting, it's just lacking that little something. Doesn't mean it's a bad bike, but 
it doesn't get you super excited like perhaps a Ducati Street Fighter might. One thing I really wasn't happy about with this bike though is how dirty it gets if you ride it in the wet. If you're someone that rides your bike all year round or you're not afraid of getting caught in a storm, then this is something that's probably gonna bug you too. Dirt goes everywhere. With the standard rear number plate, guard, whatever you wanna call it, it's just not enough. And it means that all the dirt gets flicked off the tire in the wet, gets chucked all the way up, over your back, over the rear seat, not only that, it goes on top of the rear hugger, it goes on the rear shock, and there's a little recess down there that fills with all the rubbish. Underneath the bike gets absolutely filthy as well, and the wheels, whilst they look brilliant, it means they're a bit of a pain to clean. I've never ridden a bike so little distance in the wet and had to do so much cleaning. One final point on things that I don't like about this bike is on the front of the engine, everything about this bike is black edition. But on the front of the engine, there is this oil cooler assembly and part of it is in silver. And I just think if they're going to go to the stretch of putting a black coating on the forks, for example, to make everything black on black, then perhaps maybe they could have gone a little bit further and made sure that all of the engine components were in the same style. It just feels like a little bit of a missed trick and I can't see or think of any engineering reasons why it shouldn't be. Overall, this bike really is a fantastic bike and one of my favourite bikes I've ever ridden. It's just so good, it's easy to jump on, go quickly, go slowly, it looks fantastic, it sounds brilliant and let's face it, it's not too bad a price. However, if retro bikes or naked bikes are your thing, there are cheaper ones in the market. Look at, for example, the Yamaha XSR900, that's significantly cheaper than this CB1000R. Equally, so are things like the Ducati Scrambler 1100s. Also, you get things like the Yamaha MT-10, which is cheaper, faster, and arguably has some better equipment on it. So it's really gonna depend what you're after, but I think for something that looks this good and goes as well as it does, it's in a bit of a market of its own. So I'll leave that for you to decide. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this. If you've liked this video and you want to see other bike reviews, take a look at this link. And if you want to subscribe to the channel, then it's down here.